Hello, everybody, and welcome to this lecture on Geographic Information Systems, or GIS. So uh, the main question that we're going to try and solve today is, what is GIS? And um, it's really, it's an all-encompassing um, system of spatial analysis based on um, data collected uh, remotely. And what, what's the purpose of that is that it provides us with um, an opportunity to take and try and um, take what we visually see in the world and actually turn that into useful data that we can then um, give to other people or, or uh, better explain to other people. The idea of people being able to see something visually and have the numbers behind it is so much easier for them to understand. And our big uh, our big use of GIS right now is that idea of being able to take a visual and take the numbers, the quantitative data behind it, and give it to the individuals who need it. So on a more um, specific uh, Definition basis, geographic information systems. A computer-based system to aid in the collection, maintenance, storage, analysis, output, and distribution of spatial data and information. Uh, if we want to get um, much less complicated, it's, it's applied geography um, at its simplest, and it's applied geography where um, we use spatial analysis and data to provide users with information. So what is this data that, that I'm speaking of? Um, objects occupy space. And we know that because we can find the location of things. We've talked about that before with coordinates and coordinate data. Um, so the big thing for us is to figure out um, the quantitative location of important features or objects. So things that we value or things that we're interested in, we want to know where they are and how they're taking up space. And so spatial data helps us to helps give us um, both a picture of what's there as well as a location to what is there. And it's important to get both because the data is going to give us, we're going to get some numbers or we're going to get um, a uh, picture of an area, but we also need that spatial component, that location component that goes with it. So GIS is a, it's a system, and so it's a lot of different moving parts that come together to, um, to give us the information that we need. So when we say GIS works, it takes, um, takes much more than just, uh, some satellites and a computer. So uh, there are five parts to the GIS system, hardware, software, data, people, and methods. And some people would say there's a sixth part, which is the idea that those um, five parts together form a network of information. And so um, whether you see it as five parts of a GIS system or six parts, um, Either way is correct in my mind, but it's the hardware, software, data, people, and methods, and you combine that all together into a network of information. And so hardware, um, we're, we're talking about computers. Uh, so the central piece of equipment uh, in terms of hardware is the workstation. And um, it's, it's been that uh, there's been desktop um, software applied to the, the hardware. Now a lot of it is cloud computing or online. So uh, it, it can really depend. But when we're talking about hardware, we're just talking about the, um, the equipment itself needed. Um, but with, with the way that the web is being used nowadays, um, hardware can be different. Uh, it used to just be a computer, but now it can be tablets. Now it can be cell phones. Now it can be, um, there's all sorts of different um, technology, whether it's handheld technology or mobile GIS. There's all sorts of different ways. 
but um, for the most part, it's usually a computer. In terms of software, it's usually some sort of a GIS uh, application package. Um, the most popular one being uh, ArcGIS, but it's it's basically a software package where you can um, it's it's a series of tools that allow you to take the different layers of data that you'll have and then be able to manipulate them in order to create maps or to create pictures or edit the data, edit, analyze uh, the data in any way that you need in order to be able to get the work done. And so the most popular one uh, right now is ArcGIS and the suite that is uh, most used right now is ArcGIS Pro. They've recently switched from their desktop to Pro, which is a little more cloud computing based. But um, looking at this picture here on the right, you'll have a screen where you can have your, um, your um, spatial data being displayed. Uh, and then you'll have a table of contents. And then you'll have menus at the top where you can um, you where you have all the tools available to you in order to edit, analyze, or uh, manipulate the, the spatial data to, to your liking. So uh, with ArcGIS, it's by far the most popular software suite. It's got a large user base. Uh, it's developed by uh, ESRI or Esri. It's used worldwide, and Esri hosts a huge... Uh, a huge uh, conference every year just teaching more and more people how to use ArcGIS. It's got a large set of geoprocessing procedures. Um, so basically the idea is ArcGIS has the biggest toolbox. And so why does everybody want ArcGIS as opposed to the other ones is because the amount of tools that you're that you're given and the amount of different things that you have are there and then because so many people use ArcGIS everybody gets trained on ArcGIS and then it's just kind of a self-perpetuating cycle. Um, the other part of it is ArcGIS has a wide flexibility in conceptualization and modeling so you got this broad selection of tools you've got all these different ways that you can manipulate your data and um, show it and display it and so that's why ArcGIS right now uh, is the most popular software package. Other GIS systems that we will use um, and that will be beneficial to us, Kern County has its own um, GIS system now. I say it has its own GIS system, but really what we're doing is we're using ArcGIS online, but uh, Kern County has its own license set up for it that we can then use it. But you'll see that when we um, use that system in lab, you'll actually see it says um, ArcGIS on the map itself. Uh, and that's this system here on the left. In the top right here, this is Web Soil Survey, uh, which if you take uh, soils with me, uh, we will definitely go over Web Soil Survey um, and uh, certainly uh, in GIS class. Uh, Google Earth is probably the uh, GIS system that most people are used to, or really just Google Maps in general, um, just navigating place to place. That is a GIS system. It's, if you think about it, just at the basics we talk about, it is, um, it's a visual, um, it's a visual, uh, concept of spatial data and, uh, locations. It gives you a map and shows you how to go from place to place. It's all, that's all we're talking about with GIS systems. So we got Google Earth. And then down here at the bottom, uh, this is QGIS, which is similar to ArcGIS in its capabilities. It's free. So anybody can get QGIS, whereas ArcGIS costs thousands of dollars. Um, but QGIS um, it's, uh, less intuitive, takes a little more effort to be able to figure it out. That's because it's free as opposed to um, having to pay for it. So, you know, it just depends on what you like. So then the next part of the of the GIS system is data. And so when we say data, what are we talking about? We're talking about all of this. So talking about um, maybe previous maps that exist or aerial photos or any um, sort of remotely sensed image. So satellite data, remote sensing, just being um, 
images taken from far away. Uh, any other digital data we might have, any other data on tables that we might have, and trying to put it all into whatever GIS software package we're using, and then we can come up with our own new piece of information to share with people. And so the big part of this is remote sensing because the the numbers can can tell a picture, um, the numbers can give a picture on their own, but to really have a picture to go with those numbers. To not just have it be here's a here's a coordinate and here's some tabular data that goes with it, but to, but to get a picture that goes with that really helps tell the story for the user and really uh, is the essence of of GIS. And so when we're talking about remote sensing, we're talking about um, having whatever piece of equipment that is far away from us being able to produce. Uh, produce imagery based on light that really um, provides us with with uh, the visual of what we're trying to analyze. And so as, as a definition, remote sensing is obtaining data from a distance without touching the object. That's the remote part. The sensing is the obtaining of the data. Um, you're just you're, you can use remote sensing for all sorts of different things, weather patterns, climate change, urban change, landscapes, ecosystems. Um, but um, all of that, the way that you use that remotely sensed data is by putting it into GIS and putting it into a GIS software package and then being able to interpret that data. And so here's just some exam some different examples of remote sensing. For the most part, um, we're either going to be using some aerial images um, or uh, satellite imagery. Um, sometimes you can, if you have it available to you, you can um, get drone footage, and um, that would that's interesting. Um, but there's some advantages and disadvantages to these uh, different systems that you use. Um, with the drones you get very high resolution imagery but you get a small extent because they can't fly that far. With airplanes you get high resolution imagery but you get a smaller extent. Not as small as the UAV or the drones um, but then it also becomes expensive because you got to pay for flights and you also have to have somebody who can fly a plane. Uh, with your low earth orbit satellites you get high to coarse resolution so you might get some good resolution imagery and you might get some not great resolution imagery but it covers a large area but you also get problems with clouds and um, atmospheric interference and all sorts of other things that could be problematic so they all have their advantages they all have their disadvantages but this is the basic idea of it you've got um, a satellite or you've got a plane or you got a drone or some sort of system and you you cover this piece of the planet and you get this image you get this flattened out version of the 3d world um, whether it's through the the plane going overhead or the satellites way above you get you get this picture of one part of the planet um, that you're hope that you're doing your research in and gives you a visual to be to then be able to apply things like GPS data or um, or inventory data or any sort of other data to go with it to start really painting a picture of this is what it looks like this is what's this is its location and this is what's out there which are essential uh, questions that we're trying to answer in this forestry skills class and any time we're trying to take inventory of, of a piece of land. So in GIS, data is representing a simplified view of physical entities or phenomena. And so I, we really want to know the spatial location. Where is it? We want to have any information we can on the non-spatial properties and how much of it's there. And then uh, each entity will be represented by a spatial feature or a map object. And with that map object, you'll have a subset of essential characteristics. And that uh, subset of essential characteristics is going to be uh, what we call attributes. And we'll talk about that in a couple slides. 
And so your your uh, object, which you've called it before, or your spatial feature, whichever whatever the focal point is of your uh, GIS analysis, it's an abstract representation of reality that's stored in this uh, spatial database. Now, the hard part and where it really gets important to understand GIS and the goals of using GIS is that it's going to be an imperfect representation. It's not going to be the perfect picture. Maybe, maybe it is, but maybe it's not. But your goal as, as the, um, GIS user or as the GIS technician is to figure out how is the best way to represent that data? What can you do when you see this table full of information and this picture and know what your goal is to try and put out there? How do you best represent that? How do you best put it out there? Because there's different ways that you can manipulate the data. And that's going to be the, the focus of our second uh, GIS lecture. Uh, the following week is is how do we actually represent that data or best represent it and what are the different ways we can represent it but the goal of the GIS user with this idea of data is that you want to define objects that support the intended use at the desired level of detail and accuracy well, what does that mean I want to be able to give a definition to these objects I want to be able to let people understand what I'm trying to convey when they look at this, they look at a map that I've made or they look at a picture that I've made or they see a figure that is attached into a paper that when you look at that, it supports the intended use and it really def gives you a level of detail and accuracy that could not be provided just by looking at a table alone or just by being given some coordinates. It's the combination of the table of information, the coordinates, and this visual picture that then define this object and really uh, paint the picture for the user. And so the spatial, uh, spatial part of data still comes down to coordinates, which are just used to define the location and the extent of objects, because we might be talking about um, a, a specific piece of land or we might be talking about a forest or we might be talking about uh, just one specific um, tree or one specific fire whatever it is that we're talking about we need to uh, be able to define not only its location it's right there but then also say how big it is so it's right there but it's also 117 acres or 116,049 acres whatever size that goes with it. We want to be able to define not only the location where it is, but the extent of how big it is and how far out does it go. And um, usually with coordinates, we're going to get that XY pairing or we're going to get an XYZ pairing if we're doing anything in 3D, which um, ArcGIS and other sy systems do allow for some 3D uh, modeling as well. Uh, coordinates quantify the distance from origin when measured along a standard direction. So it's they're important in GIS because a lot of what can be done in GIS is taking the data and measuring uh, the data and being able to then interpret um, interpret from our measurements of the GIS data even more uh, even more data and more information. So it's important. To be able to know the spatial location and extent of these objects. So, in terms of organizing the data, because now we so we started off with the idea that you stick all this stuff into the software system and then you find a way to manipulate it, but you got to have organization to it. So you've got to have keys and labels or other indices that help you figure it out. And so the the way that GIS works um, most, or uh, the easiest way to describe it is it's just a set of layers. They're, they have these thematic layers and you can get uh, different layers and stack them on top of each other. So you can have a soils layer that I maybe got from Web Soil Survey. And I might have a um, track boundary that I got from using my GPS. And I might have um, some attribute data 
that I've written in a table in Excel on my computer. And then I might have an aerial image that I've gotten of the area. And then maybe I have some county level data that I've gotten from the, the Kern County website. And then I put all those layers on top of each other and that starts to form one map. And so what do these different layers look like or um, the different uh, types of data structures? There are uh, the two main ones are vector and raster, and we're going to talk about those next week. But you can see different ways that you can possibly represent uh, different types of data. Um, and it's going to be the big, the big difference uh, between, the, between the two is just going to be how are we how are we trying to represent things or do we have continuous data or do we have um uh simple data to where it's it's very specific and um vector is much better for simple data raster is much better for continuous data like slope and so we're going to take this data, the, the spatial data that we have, we're going to get our visual image uh, if, we, if we want one in our analysis. And then we're also going to have something called attribute data, which is any sort of tabular data that we've um, gathered for a project. So that'll be in an attribute table or it might be in an Excel file that you then have to bring into an attribute table. But then what happens is you'll have it to where that data is tied spatially to an object. So, for instance, uh, we've got the state of Washington here at the top of this attribute table. And you can see uh, behind it that the state of Washington is highlighted. And so this here in this table, this is all the uh, attribute information associated with the state of Washington. And you can say the same thing for the state of Maine because that's also highlighted. And you can see Maine is highlighted over here. But you can see Montana right here is not highlighted, so it's not part of the current search. But Montana still has information with it as well. And there's a lot of um, GIS data out there right now just available to the public through uh, different um, entities like the U.S. Census or the Forest Service, um, or uh, just other different places, Kern County, to where you can get some, some data that's already uh, spatially attributed to locations. And so attribute data, um, in its simplest definition, is defining characteristics that are related to the object and its location. So it's some sort of complementary data that is collected and referenced to each object. Um, for instance, simple attribute data in forestry would be if you're looking at a stand, a stand map. So it's an area that says, you know, here is stand A and stand B and stand C. When you click on stand A, it would say stand A is this many acres and it was planted at this date and it's this species and it has, um, and it's got, um, this spacing that it was planted on which means it has this many trees per acre and you can have that you can have some simple attribute data or you can have attribute data i've looked at some attribute tables where you have thousands and thousands of pieces of of information in an attribute table so it really just kind of um, depends on how much information you want to put in your system the more information you have the more robust your um your manipulation and, and analyzation can be. However, it also means that it's that much harder sometimes to find the information that you're looking for. Um, another way to really just think about attribute data or the this tabular data is it's your not it's the non-spatial components of the objects. So it's the stuff that isn't um, represented by represented spatially. So some examples I put here: stand name, stand type the product uh, that you're trying to get off of it, the size or acreage, uh, the size of the perimeter, those sorts of things, the non-spatial components. And then, so you put all this together, all this data, and you're gonna put it together in a data model. 
So you're going to take all the different layers. So in this case, we're trying to represent the real world here. And so the real world has all these different pieces to it. So it's got this customer base. It's got a street layer. It's got a parcels layer, elevation layer, land usage layer. And you put that all together and you can get this uh, representation here. But you need all these different pieces to be able to make that happen. And so a spatial data model is where you're taking the objects in the spatial database and then um, basically providing a, 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 a relationship between them and taking them and putting them together and then manipulating that spatial data together. So if we look at this basic forest access model, so how do I get access into this forest? Well, I've got a slope layer, I've got an ownership layer, I've got a water layer, and I got a sensitive areas layer and a watersheds layer. And I need to do uh, some GIS work to some of these layers. Like I need to create a uh, water proximity and I need to create a slope impedance and I need to do a discrete cost surface. I need to then bring in a roads layer and a forest layer and I need to do more GIS work. And eventually I can, oops, let me go right back. I can create this accessible forest uh, model where I've taken some of these different layers from up here and I've put them together to where I can have this model that now uh, says green areas um, represent something, red areas represent something, yellow areas represent something in terms of my accessibility to the forest. So then hopefully what your question is or what you're saying in your head is, wow, that sounds great. GIS sounds useful. But now hopefully you're saying, how do I use GIS and what can I do with it? So what are the applications of GIS? And so um, really we want to take um, what we have, our five, our five um, parts of it, combine them together, and then go through the process, which is, we start with the physical world, we figure out what we want to define in that physical world or what our objects are going to be that we're looking for. We collect and edit the spatial data, we analyze that spatial data, we're going to report our results, and then we're going to give it to the people who need to make the decisions and hopefully do some actions to then do something to hopefully better the physical world. And we continue on that. Uh, on that loop. What is GIS used for? All sorts of things. If we take a look at this picture on the right, uh, engineering design, site selection, watershed analysis, resource inventories, land management, network analysis, incident mapping, spatial measurement, corridor selection, transportation modeling, logistics routing, resource exploration, facility management, geoprocess modeling, spread and diffusion, topographic analysis, demographic analysis, lots of different things that GIS can be used for in terms of trying to figure it out. And this is just a list of examples. It is nowhere near a comprehensive list of what GIS is used for. But let's kind of go through a few examples just to kind of give you some ideas. So um, to give you kind of the... Um, Another way to look at the modeling approach is I come up with some sort of application, like I need to fix a pipeline. So what GIS um, functions or what GIS tools in whatever software I'm using am I going to need? I'm going to need an overlay, a network analysis, a spatial analysis, a spatial queries, and AML programming. And then uh, my database management is going to be uh, spatial data and attributes need to be inputted. They need to be transformed, stored, retrieved, and displayed. I'm going to need some census data, some earthquake intensity information, some water supply network data of the metropolitan area, all to do this one pipeline fix in Memphis or create the um, GIS data behind that for people to, to be able to see clearly what we're trying to do. So here is just some examples, some basic examples of GIS data at work. So here's uh, here's some simple maps. This map is of the Flathead Indian Reservation. So you can see um, we've got an inset map. is where where it shows the Lolo National Forest and the Flathead 
Indian Reservation. We also have um, these uh, little icons here showing the neighboring um, national forests around the Flathead Indian Reservation. On the right hand side here, this is a map of a piece of property in Georgia that I've done some work on and th this is a stand map. So uh, these codes here uh, are for the different stands and for the uh, different um, uh, species that are in those stands. So SL is planted slash pine, LL is planted uh, longleaf pine, and then uh, LB is planted loblolly pine. So this stand here has all three of them in it. It has loblolly, longleaf, and slash all planted in it, whereas the other ones are either slash or um, longleaf planted in this uh, on this piece of property. And you can also see in this one, we didn't use any uh, aerial imagery or any remotely sensed images, whereas on the right hand side here, you can see this is a remotely sensed image. This is an aerial image here, and I've provided a scale and a legend as well. Uh, here is uh, some information I took from um, ArcGIS. Uh, we've got the creek creek fire and we can see um, just the size of the creek fire so trying to just put this idea together in terms of how how we're using GIS and what GIS is so we're we're able to do um, even quick uh, really quick analysis with GIS so the creek fire which is currently happening while we're recording um, this lecture so it Here's the size, here's how much has been uh, contained, here's the last update. It's a wildfire, it shows you a map of where the fire has, has gotten to, as well as this image on the left, these are the evacuation zones for the, for the creek fire. So you can see the perimeter of the creek fire here within the evacuation zones, and then the different coding. I know that I didn't uh, have room to put the legend there, but they have different codes for the different uh, evacuation zones, but um, you can get information right away um, and very useful and timely information uh, via, GIA, via GIS. Um, some other information you can get with GIS or other applications, um, you can also look at, at historical data and map a lot of um, historical trends. So here um, when we're looking at uh, this area here uh, in the uh, Lactev Sea, and you can kind of see with this inset map where the area that we're kind of talking about, you can see how the shoreline has, um, has retreated. So in 1964, the shoreline was here, 1969, 1975, 1981, and now 2006, the shoreline is there. And so you can do you can look at long-term studies and historical data and really use GIS um, for, for, um, to your advantage to really uh, help still paint the picture of what you're trying to see. So in the previous image, we were really trying to see um, the creek fire and how big it's gotten and um, what information we can know right away. Whereas with this image here, we're looking at historical data and trying to really look at a trend in historical data and really say here look this is this is problematic because this the shoreline was out here um, you know almost uh, you know 50 or almost 40 years ago whereas now it's it's retreated all the way back here and not only can we say that but then with GIS um, as long as this is done to scale we can measure exactly how much shoreline has been lost in that 40 years and then we can come up with an average loss of shoreline per year and really start putting numbers to the picture and really start trying to tell the story that we want to tell through through this data and and about this this object or spatial feature um, there's an article here that i've linked um, that i'd uh, love for you guys to check out you can always press pause right now um, go on to the the pdf of the slides and then Go click on that article, but uh, UPS is huge on their use of GIS systems. And the article there talks about how um, in large metropolitan cities, uh, UPS has basically, through GIS analysis, realized that the time spent with their drivers trying to make left-hand turns is 
too long and that they can actually save millions of dollars if their drivers only do right hand turns and so it's figuring out how to do something uh efficient like that um that gis has aided them in uh helping to uh to helping them to save time and helping them to really um make their their logistical pattern uh, much more efficient and so uh, kind of the final idea i'll leave you with is just the idea that gis is changing everything it changes the way we look at the world it changes um, even basic things that we do uh, my biggest uh, my biggest um, i guess example of how gis is changing everything is to really think about um, what life was like 10 years ago or 15 years ago in terms of just thinking about what information is in your cell phone and what it when you were trying to find something 10 15 20 years ago you're trying to go place to place uh, think about how reliant you are now on um, on some sort of a GIS system being in your car and being able to punch in uh, location and be able to go right to it or being able to um, access it through your cell phone it's it changes the way we we see the world it changes the way we organize and communicate it changes the way um, we look at the world uh, maps and uh, globes are now computerized and we can see all these different places and get all this information on these areas that we didn't know before and it really it can it can influence how we act and how we kind of go about our day so it doesn't seem like maybe GIS is involved in your daily life but it's probably has more of an influence than you realize <laughs>